today. We are so honored you're here. Uh, if you would, let's grab your Bibles. We're going to go to the Word of God, a very familiar passage, the book of Matthew, the 16th chapter, uh, beginning with verse 13 through 19. And I'm going to, I'm going to kind of, I'm going to read over this and then I'm going to kind of unpack it for us today. If you did not grab a hot sheet or didn't didn't get handed one when you came in, it's it's kind of a fill in thing for these notes today. Raise your hand. One of our ushers are going to be watching. They're back there watching. All you got to do is raise your hand and say, I want a hot sheet because you can follow along with the message and it helps take notes. But I want us to look at the book of Matthew. I'm going to simply talk to you about this thought, a place of freedom. Now, let me ask you, how many of you enjoy living or want to live in a place of freedom? Come on. If I don't see your hand, then I'm assuming you don't want to. You're going, man, pastor, I love to be bound. No, we all want to live in a place of freedom. And so today we're going to, I'm going to break this down for us. And I hopefully am going to help you and not only you, but how many of you have folks in your life that you'd love them to be set free? So hopefully somebody's going to get set free through this today. And so today, the book of Matthew, the 16th chapter, it said, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, some say that John the Baptist, some say you're Elijah, others Jeremiah, and one of the prophets. He said to them, and, and I love this, he said, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. He said, and I will give you the keys. Look at somebody and say, the keys. He said, I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And so today, keys are a very interesting thing. Here's the thing. How many of you, I have a certain place in my house that I keep my keys. And if, if my wife hides them from me, there are times she does that. Not really. Sometimes I misplace them. But normally, how many of you have ever had a situation where you're needing to go somewhere in a hurry and you can't find your keys? My my wife will do that from time to time. She's got a purse that you could actually fit our whole house in. And sometimes I think she has our whole house in it. And she's like, I can't find my keys. I'm like, where did you put them? Well, they're in here somewhere. And I'm like, why don't you just put them right there where I put mine at? It'd be a lot easier. But isn't it, a lot of times we, we cannot find our keys and it's frustrating because we're needing to go somewhere, but we have to have our keys. And so it's the same way as it is in the natural, it's also the same way in the spiritual. You, you're trying to go somewhere in the spiritual, but you can't find the keys because there is a key that's going to get you from one place to another. And so the Lord has made a promise. We have to understand that we made a promise or God's made a promise to us, but here's the problem. So many times in the Christian world, we're not using the keys. He said, he told Peter, he said, I'm gonna give you the keys to the kingdom. And so he has given us keys to use, but the problem is a lot of times we don't use the keys. And so Jesus is talking to the disciples in this text And he's first talking to them about the beginning of the church. He is discussing about them. And then at the end of the talk, he said, hey, by the way, he said, I've got some keys that I want to give you. And he said, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And and so for too long, I really believe that the church today, and I'm talking just in general, and know this, the church, when I say the church, is not necessarily the building but we are the church. And so uh, in general today, a lot of times we have not gotten the full measure of what the Holy Spirit wants to do for us on the earth because we have not used the keys that we have been given. You know, you can have access to my truck, but you got to have the key. 
You can have access to my house, but you got to have a key. You can access certain things in God's kingdom, but you got to have the right key. Now, again, I believe that in a day and time that we are living in, that God is wanting to unlock the full potential of the local church. Come on, some, it's not that bad. Somebody help me today. Because here's what I believe. I still think breakthrough happens in the local church. I still believe that healing happens in the local church. If I didn't believe it, I wouldn't be announcing Prophet Lloyd. I believe that healing still happens. You're here today, and you say, I need a breakthrough in my life. Guess what? I believe that today you can receive. Why? Because of the Holy Spirit. I believe you can have breakthrough. I believe that there are still signs and wonders that are happening in the church. And this is a good one because today's society don't necessarily feel this, but I still believe that Jesus Christ is the Lord of the church. I think, I think it's all about him. I think he is the reason that any of us are here today. And I think that we need to get that in our minds and say, hey, wait a minute. The church really is about Jesus Christ. And so Jesus is walking and he's talking to his disciples. And again, he, he's in Caesarea Philippi. And I want us to notice, he asked these guys and he said, okay, guys, just tell me and imagine them walking along. Who, who are, who is everybody saying I am? Who, who are they saying? What, what, you know, sometimes you'll ask people, what are they saying about me? Who, who are they saying that I am? And, and they looked at him and they told him what folks were saying of who he was and who they all thought they, that he was. Because let me help you something. Everybody's going to have an opinion of you. <laughs> but their opinion does not matter. Then he begins to look at them and he says, hey, Guess what? I want to know something. Who am I? Who do you say I am? Come on, Peter. Who, who do you say that I am? Who, who are you saying? And so the question today that I want to ask everybody here, who is Jesus to you? You know, it really doesn't matter who he is to me. Who is he to you? Because that's the question that you have to ask. Because here's the thing. If you have experienced Jesus, hear me today, there ought to be something that is down on the inside of you that you cannot contain of telling what he done for you. Just like those folks that were giving their testimony on the screen. There should be, if you, if you have ever experienced, if you're here today and you say, yeah, I've got an experience with Jesus Christ, there ought to be something inside of you that you say, I cannot contain it. I've got to just share what Jesus has Done. Come on, Father, I got to share what Jesus has done for me. Has he ever done anything for anybody sitting in here today? You ought to be to the place that you can't contain it. He healed my body. He touched my mind. He saved me just, how many of you were saved just in time? Because it's hard for me to see people and believe that God has done supernatural things in their life and they don't talk about it. They don't want to say a word. They don't want to say nothing about it. Because here's what I know. If you eat at a good restaurant, guess what? You tell everybody. You don't even know the people. You hear them talking at Walmart. Yeah, we're thinking about going. To, hey, man, you ought to go here. You ought to go to Polar Whip. You ever heard of Polar Whip? Man, they've got the best burgers you have ever seen. Yeah, let's give it up for Polar Whip. <laughs> But if you have eaten at a great restaurant, we, we do not hesitate on telling people something about, what about when Jesus does something in your life? What if we get to the point that you won't hesitate to tell people what he's done in your life? What if we get to the point where people are looking for an encounter with Jesus Christ, if we just say, oh, let me tell you what he did for me. Let me tell you, man, I once was lost as we talked Wednesday night. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind. Oh, y'all don't understand. I was blind blind but guess what now all of a sudden I'm able to see so Jesus is talking to his disciples and he's saying who, who is it you're saying that I am but but I want us to notice something where he's at when he asked this question is almost as important as the question is itself where he's asking it from. The Bible says that they were in the region of Caesarea Philippi. 
Jesus asked this question, and don't miss this, at a specific moment, at a specific place, because he wanted the devil to know what was coming. He wanted the devil to know what was coming. And so he was in this mountainous region in Caesarea Philippi, and the, the theologians believe that he was up at the top and he was talking and he was standing on these rocks. Now, at the bottom of these rocks, at the bottom of this hill or this mountain, there was a cave that was known as the Cave of Pan. Have you all ever heard this? It was known as the Cave of Pan. It was a, Pan was a pagan god who, he was the god of sexuality and sensuality. And so you have below Jesus on this hill, this mountain, is the cave of Pan. Now, believe, people believe that Pan would come out ever so often, and he would bless the people, and he would, he would bless their land, he would bless their crops. Those that, those that worship this pagan god, they believe that he would come out. And, and so, and he would bless them. Now, again... They, they were involved in every form. When he would come out and bless them, and I'm not going into detail, but you can let your mind wonder what all they were involved in when he would come out and they felt that he was blessing them. And, and now, again, I'm not trying to shock you. I'm just laying a little groundwork for you today. But I want you to understand, Jesus, at this moment, he's standing. Let's say he's standing up on this hill and, and down below him, or, or this mountain, and down below him there is a cave where people were worship this pagan god of Pan. And, and they were doing all kinds of crazy things. And Jesus is up on top of this mountain, this hill, and he's looking at the guys that are hanging out with him. And he's saying, who do you say that I am? I, I know who everybody else is saying, but who do you say that I am? Who, who is it that you say that I am? In a place that is known, don't miss this, it is known for pagan worship, a place that was nasty, a place where people did everything, every uh, ungodly thing that they could think of, and Jesus looks at them and said, hey guys, I want to know, do you still know who I am in this place? Do, do you still know who I am? You know, as I was studying this and putting it together, it made me think of America, where we are today in America. Oh, come on, folks. There's all kinds of crazy stuff going on. There's all kinds of things that's going on, and we just, we're looking at it, and we're thinking, and I believe that Jesus is looking at America today and saying, even in the middle of this, come on, love and truth, folk, do you still know who Jesus is? Even in the midst of everything, do you still know? Because let me help you something. God has not changed his mind about sin. It is not because, well, it's 2023, and sin is no big deal anymore. No, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He has not changed his mind, and he's looking at people today, and he's saying, I know what everybody else is saying about, but who do you say that I am? Because here's what I know. It's easy to worship when we're in here. It's easy to worship when Israel and the team and the sound booth, and everything's kicking, and the lights are on. It's easy to worship. But you, are you, do you know who God is when you're around people that aren't thinking about God? Do, do you know who he is? Do you, and we're going to get to the freedom part in a moment. Will you still represent Jesus when nobody's talking about him? Will you still represent him where the Christian music is not playing? Will you still represent him when pastor's not around? When nobody's carrying a big old Bible and talking about, do you still know who he is? Will you still represent? Man, anybody can represent him when they come into a church. Even a sinner will come in and they know to not do certain things, but I'm talking about people that walks with Jesus. He's wanting to know, do you know who I am right wherever you are? Do you still know who he is on Monday? 
do you still love him? Or is he just a convenient Jesus? And we pull him out on Sunday morning and we get with the program. And then Monday morning when we go off to work, we put him back on a shelf and we say, I'll see you next Sunday. Are we okay? So Jesus wants to know, he's saying, can you still love me in a place where people do everything else but love me. Well, I know Pastor loves him. I know Pastor Terry loves him. I know Roger and Paula love him. I know Dane loves him. I know Chance loves him. I know Jeremy loves him. I know. No. How do you feel about him? See, because we're not going to be standing before him as a team. We're going to be standing before him as individuals. Something else about that cave, it was also known as the gateway to hell. And so Jesus, think about this. (laughs) It's the gateway to hell. So Jesus was on top of the rock, and he was asking who everybody was saying he was. And then he looked at them, and he said, but who do you say that I am? And Peter said this. He said, well, I know who you are. He said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And so Jesus looks at him and he said, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father, which is in heaven. And he said, I also say to you that you are now Peter. Now, the word Peter is Petros. And I love this part, which means a small rock off the big rock. How many of you are are a small rock off the big rock? Guess what? If you're a small rock off the big rock, then when they look at you, they're going to see where you came from. So he said, basically, he said, you're the the small rock off the big rock. And he said, on this rock, he said, I'm going to build my church. Let me help you. Hear hear me clearly today. Because this is teach, preach. This is whatever God wants it to be. Jesus is not looking for a safe place to build his church. He's not looking for a clean place to build his church. Don't miss this. He's looking for dirty He's looking for sticky. He doesn't care what you've done. He wants to build his church right there. Oh, come on. You say, well, I haven't got a, you know what? That's where he wants to build it. He, He wants to build his church right there. Jesus goes on to say this, and I love it. He said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And Jesus, think about it. He was not talking metaphorically. He was standing on a place where people thought hell had dominion. And he basically said, you know what? I'm going to build my church on top of what hell thought it owned. We sing that song, the enemy thought he had me. But Jesus said, oh, no, wait a minute. (laughs) That's my child. Jesus said, that's where I want to build the church. I want to build the church. I don't, I don't want to build a church on somebody that has it all together and somebody that says, well, I'm perfect in every way and you ought to be thankful that I walk into this building. No, he said, I don't want to build my church there. I want to build my church on some messed up people that don't have it all together. That's where I want my church to be. So if you think that he's got to be perfect, that you've got to be perfect for him to build his church. Uh uh-uh. uh. He said, on this rock, I'm going to build my church. And so, let me, and I know I'm asking some questions, but it's just, I just want you to think about it today. So, who is Jesus to you in a time of compromise? Who's Jesus to you in a time of compromise? If we are the hands and feet of Jesus, then we need to be able to speak speak to people whenever and wherever. No, no. If we are the hands and feet of Jesus, 
We need to be able to speak to people whenever and wherever. You shouldn't go to Walmart just because somebody don't look like you and say, I can't talk to them. If you're doing that, you're not the hands and feet of Jesus. Look at your neighbor and say, we're getting there. I don't want you to lose hope. Here's your first fill-in. Your commitment to God and the revelation of God is most clearly revealed in the presence of choice. Your commitment to God, how you are committed to God, and the revelation of God is most clearly revealed in the presence of choice. That's why Jesus looked at them and he said, who do you say that I am? He didn't tell them. He didn't say, well, here's who you need to say I am. He said, who do you say that I am? He said, you know what they do down at the base of this cave, but who do you say that I am? Now, we have to understand something. Jesus didn't have this conversation at the base of the cave. He wasn't down in the middle of it. He was above it. So he says, you know what's down there? He said, I'm trying to get you up here. I don't want you to hang out down there. I want you to hang up here. And so every time Jesus wants to do something, hear me, he wants to elevate you. He's trying to pick you up. He's trying to lift you up. He wants to take you higher in your thinking. He wants you to think a little bit higher, not only of him, but of yourself. He wants to take you higher in your influence. He wants to take you higher in your authority. He's getting you free from the stuff that held you hostage. And now he's saying, hey, I want to bring you up higher. And not just you hostage, but hear me very clearly, the generations before you hostage. He wants to get you in a place of freedom. He said, I want to take you in a place of freedom. Let me, how many of you have ever experienced warfare? Some of y'all don't know what you're missing. <laughs> have you ever wondered why warfare is so hard in your life? Come on, have, have you ever thought about why is warfare so hard? Because here's the thing you have to understand. You're not fighting just against you. You're fighting against the spirit that maybe had your mom and your dad, the spirit that maybe had grandma and grandpa, the spirit that maybe had great-grandma and great-grandpa, and you're fighting it, and now all of a sudden you're resisting, and you're saying, I know what used to happen then, but it's not, you know, I'm talking about generational curses, and it's got to break with somebody. Somebody's going to have to be man or woman enough to stand up and say, you know what? It stops right here. It's not going to go any farther. It's not going to go to my kids. It's not going to go to my grandkids. You say it's not going to happen. And now all of a sudden the devil is ticked off. Why? Because you're fighting harder than anybody before you ever did. He must really be ticked off at me the last 10 months. But I don't care. I'm still fighting. I'm still here. I'm still standing. I'm still able to move. I'm still. And so that's why you're here this morning. Oh, no, I just came because I didn't have. No, you're here because you said, you know what? I got to get in the house of God because guess what? Something is trying to stop me from getting to God and it's not going to happen. I'm going to get to the house of God. Yeah, but you got other things to do. I know, but I got to get to the house of God. You got other places you got to be. No, nah, but I got to get to the house of God. I, I, why? Because guess what? My destiny is dependent on it. And not only is your destiny, don't get mad at your kids if they don't want to go to church. If you... Jesus said, upon this rock, I'll build my church. And he said, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And the Bible said, as we read a while ago, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Here's what happens so many times, another feeling. So many people want a convenient Jesus. They just want a bite-sized Jesus. They just, just I mean... But here's what we have to understand. Jesus cannot be contained in one bite. 
He wants the church to grow. And what I mean by the church, not only us as a congregation, but he wants the church, you. He wants you to grow. Yeah, but man, I'm 61. It doesn't matter. He said, I want you to grow. Well, I'm still young. He wants, why do you think we do LTK? We don't do it to babysit your kids. We want your kids to grow. We have to understand something. Again, we are not, hear me very clear. If you're ever wondering, if you're thinking, man, what kind of church is this? Maybe you're a guest and you're wondering. Hey, let me help you. We are not looking for people who remind us of ourselves. We are a whosoever will church. It doesn't matter your background. Doesn't matter what you look like. Doesn't matter what color you are. Doesn't matter where you came from. I don't care what side of the tracks you grew up on. Guess what? This is a whosoever will church. Anybody that wants to come in and say, I need to be put in a place of freedom. I need to find freedom in Jesus Christ, guess what? You come to the right place because it really doesn't matter to us where you came from. All that matters to us is where you're going and we're doing our best to help you get to the place that you want to go. Somebody give him some praise in the house. Now, the, the problem is it's easier said than done a lot of times. We say, yeah, there's a, because we're all used to the familiar. We like the familiar. We I mean, I know what I'm going to do this afternoon. And if you come and knock on my door, I'm not answering. <laughs> I already know why, because I like the familiar. Somebody say, you want to go out to eat? <laughs> I got plans. Because <laughs> I got the familiar. What we have to understand is Jesus did not die just for me and you. He didn't die just for the familiar. He didn't die just for the comfortable. He didn't die just for us. He also didn't die for us to turn this into a club and congratulate one another on our perceived version of spiritual authority. He didn't die for that. We, we need to be so moved by the finished work of Jesus Christ that we take what we are learning in here and we take it outside these four walls and we're able to be the hands and feet of Jesus and, and we say, you know what? A place where uh, maybe take it out to a place where normally isn't celebrated. Dane and Kelly are over this ministry and they go out on Saturday nights and they're talking to people on the streets of Marion, Carbondale, wherever they can find somebody and they're going out to places and I love that they're doing this and guess what? They're being the hands and feet of Jesus. Yeah, but man, aren't you scared? Now I'm just doing what Jesus wants me to do. I'm going out to the places not where every normal person goes. They're not going, I'm sorry, and I don't mean this bad, but they're not going over to Coca Pelle to the golf course and saying, hey, we want to share Jesus, although those people do need Jesus, but they're walking the street. They took my wife one night and they walked 833 miles one evening, I think. And they, they walked all over Carbondale and, and, and sharing Jesus Christ. What are you saying, Pastor? What are you trying to tell us? Here's what I'm trying to tell you. There are people in your world, in your influence, you don't even have to go outside of that, that they need to be in a place of freedom just like you are. And guess what? They need you to do more than just write it on a card. They need you to go out and say, hey, look what Jesus done for me. Look what he's done in my life. And guess what? The same freedom is for you. Everybody has their idea of what church should be like. But here's the thing. If I really did find a place of freedom, if you really think this is a place of freedom, if you've got a house that is not made by hands, why should you contain, why, why would you contain your exuberance? How can I? How, how can we? How can we? We cannot contain it. Je Jesus said this to John. He said, or Jesus said this. He said, John the Baptist came neither eating or drinking, and they said he had a demon. He said, I came eating and drinking, and they said, I'm a friend of wine bibbers, tax collectors, and sinners, but wisdom is justified by her children. Now I'm talking about us helping others get freedom. See, because Jesus didn't just set us free for us to be free. He set us free to help other people get free. They deserve a place of freedom just like I did. 
So before we start judging, let's wait for the fruit to be produced. Oh, I bet they don't want to know about Jesus. All they're doing is just a bum. They're sitting on the street with a sign. We'll work for food, and I bet they won't work. I bet they won't do anything. You might be right, but guess what? They still need Jesus. I've said this all along, and I'm not trying to be political because we will not be political. Well, the White House, we need to get a good president. No, we need a president that is full of the Holy Ghost. And so we can't judge. Another thing, we can't look at people and say, man, you know, because here's what we have to understand. You might see people going in a certain house, and it could be that they're reaching out to the people in that house. You might say, well, that's a drug house. What's what's pastor doing around there? Maybe I'm trying to reach those people. Why? Because they need the freedom just like we needed freedom. So if we are going to be a church, and again, I'm talking about us as a congregation. I'm talking about us as an individual. If we are going to be a church that is truly pushing the kingdom forward, Here's something that I want to help you with. You cannot be scared. You can't be scared. Man, I don't know. Because here's the thing. The enemy is counting on fear holding you hostage. He's wanting to keep you from doing the thing that God created you to do. See, because everybody in here, and I've said it, and I'll continue to say it until I take my last breath. Everybody in here is created to do something by God. You have a gifting. If you're here and you're sitting and doing nothing, you're not fulfilling what God created you to do. You're just not. Well, I'm not sure what it is. Do something until you figure it out. Do something until you figure it out. What, What a tragedy. Think about this. What a tragedy to get to the end of your life and God shows us or shows you what you could have done if you had not listened to the devil. Wow, look what you could have done. Look what you could have been. Because we live in a culture of fear. Everything's fear. You know, and again, I'm not, uh, fear and wisdom are two different things. Okay, so don't walk out and say, well, pastor thinks COVID was a joke. No, I think, but I didn't, I don't ever think we should have lived in fear. I think we should walk in wisdom. But fear, everything's geared around fear because the enemy knows that if he can keep us, I mean, think about it, scary movies today. They make billions of dollars on scary movies. And we pay unbelievable amount to take our kids to see them. And then we wonder why our kids don't want to sleep alone. Another thing we're afraid of which, that which doesn't look like us. Let me help you, love and truth especially, hear me. You cannot be afraid of people that don't look exactly like you. Because guess what? Souls don't have a color. Well, I'm not going to reach out to those people. Who are those people? Guess what? I am those people. I was those people. Because here's the thing, we're fighting for souls, we're not fighting politics. We're not fighting for color, we're not fighting for all of these things. We're fighting for souls, what? To get them out of the flames and into freedom. Every one of you today, if you're walking with Christ, guess what? That's that's your challenge, that is your goal When we walk out these doors, helping other people find a place of freedom. You know what's the coolest thing? Whenever somebody comes with you or you witness to somebody and their lives get turned around because of Jesus Christ, and all of a sudden you see them here and they're worshiping and praising God, there's no feeling like that. Because you helped be instrumental in finding their place of freedom. Now again, Something else, I believe God is unlocking the giftings of people. So you're not just skilled in one area, and I'm talking about the church. I need everybody to pay attention. You're skilled in multiple areas. Now, here, here pastor, I'm going to be a pastor for a moment now. 
don't be jealous at other people's giftings. I, I could sit back and I could say, I'm so jealous of Israel. He can play the keyboard. I'm so jealous of Suzanne and Tracy. They can sing. And I, I just, man, I'm jealous. I can't stand it. Lucas was up there today singing. Man, I'm so jealous of him. He knocked it out of the park, and that just made me mad. And I thought, I ain't going to worship God. That's crazy. Why? God didn't gift all of us the same. We all, that's why it's important you step up and use your gifting. Because God has gifted us all. Every one of us have a gifting and it's unique. And God's saying, look, I've set this place up. You, I'm going to have you, I'm going to unlock giftings in your life and you're going to be skilled in multiple areas. That's why we got guys that can work the booth. That video that we did, uh, Dane Van Scooten made that video, edited it, done everything for it. He does a lot of our media stuff. Dane's in the sound booth. Give Dane a round of applause. He done a great job editing that video. I wouldn't even know how to turn it on for you to watch it, much less shoot one. And, but I don't get jealous about what he's doing. Why? God's gifted him to do that. I don't get jealous about Lucas and what he's doing. God's gifted him. I don't get jealous about Tracy and Sid because God's gifted them. I don't get jealous about Israel because God's gifted them. But here's a th on the other hand is this. Don't be afraid to be everything God has created you to be. Yeah, but what if I mess up? Oh, let me help you. I guarantee you, you will. <laughs> Man, what if I drop the ball? I guarantee you, you will. But you got to step out and be a part of it. Here's another one that's noteworthy, even if you don't know. God is elevating passion, not ambition. If you're passionate for the kingdom, he'll put you in front of kings. But if you have ambition, guess what? You're not going to go anywhere. You got to be passionate for the kingdom. Ambition for self is not kingdom. It has to be bigger than you are. So once you become unafraid, we are a church, love and truth, cream, but we're unafraid. And once we're in a fray, three things, things are going to happen. And I'm winding this down quick, okay? I don't want you to think I'm, you're going to miss out on the fireworks. I'll have you out before dark. <laughs> once you become unafraid as a church, the first thing, you're going to be a church on fire. You know what? I don't care what people think. I plan on going to heaven and taking as many as I can with me. Well, yeah, but what, what's people going to think about you? You know what? I'm 61 years old, and I really could care less what people think about me. I've lived way too long. All I care about is what he thinks about me. So we'll be a church on fire. We'll be a church of faith. You know what? I believe I'm standing by a bunch of people that believe in faith. I think we believe in healing. I think we believe God is still doing the miraculous. And you'll be a church, and I love this one, in the field. You'll be a church in the field. Acts 2, you find a church that's on fire. The Bible says suddenly, a sound from heaven. Some, suddenly, somebody starts praising him over here and then all of a sudden it breaks out back over in the left and people's praising him there and all of a sudden then it's there and then it's on the platform and then they're... That's a church on fire. The Bible says the Holy Spirit set upon each of them in cloven tongues like a fire and they begin to speak in tongues. The Bible said that, guess what? There were people who asked, how can we hear them in our own language? This next one's good. A church on fire is a church that even though we have diversity, there is unity inside of the diversity. I might not have come where you come from, but guess what? We're still united. You might like to do different things than I like to do, but guess what? We're still united in the things of God. 
And you say, how can we be? Because I can hear what you're saying. Why? Because of the Holy Spirit. How could it be possible that we could hear them in our own language? Because what happens when the Holy Spirit begins speaking in you and it begins speaking in me, then all of a sudden, guess what? We're talking the same language. I'm just throwing some nuggets out. Come on up, Israel. Give them a little bit of hope. Don't say you have the Holy Spirit, but you do not have grace for people that don't look like you. What's crazy about it growing up when I was younger, <laughs> and I was, I was thinking I had to laugh about this, I thought my family was normal. I thought any family that didn't do what my family does was not normal. Now as I've gotten older, I look back and I find out we weren't normal. <laughs> we, I mean, some areas we were, but some areas we were just as dysfunctional as anybody. Here's what I know. Every one of us, there's not one in here that says, I'm perfect and I came from perfect. Now, the best thing I can tell you to do, I'm going to live for perfect because he's perfect. And so as I thought about that and I thought, well, I can't look at anybody and say, man, I know what normal. None of us know really what normal should be like. We have to have grace for people that don't look like us. They might not even act like us. Maybe they're in the location or the place that they have not yet received. You know, the Holy Spirit talks about the renewing of the mind. church on fire is moving in one direction though we come from many places different backgrounds but we're moving in one direction we're we're and i'm talking to you about it today i want to find i want to help people find a place of freedom you know people all the time say well when we get there it's going to be good it is going to be good but you know what i want an abundant life here now, you might, abundant life, you got to understand something, abundant life. So you say, oh, so pastor, you want new vehicles, new house? No, abundant life for me is sitting on my back porch with a cup of coffee next to my wife, watching hummingbirds. You go, that's crazy. Each person might have a different definition of an abundant life. God wants you to live in freedom. He wants you to have an abundant life. Not only do we need to be a church on fire, we need to be a church of faith. A church that says, you know what, I still believe in miracles. That's why I'm pushing on July 26th. Bring everybody you can. We've got a Facebook page, an event page. If you're on Facebook, share it. Don't just like it, share it. Hey, I'm, what will people think? <laughs> Who cares what they think? What if people get healed? Get on there and share. Let's reach out. You say, you just want people to come to church. No, I just want to see people healed. They might go somewhere else. Why? Why do we want to do that? Because we're a church of faith. I still believe in miracles. And then to me, one of the most important is we need to be a church in the field. Matthew 22, we find Jesus talking about a king who invited everybody to his banquet. Some people gave excuses of why they couldn't come and some of the others seized the servants of the king and they killed them. Jesus was giving an illustration about when the prophets who were sent to the children of Israel they didn't want to hear what the prophets had to say, so they killed the prophets. The Bible said the king was angry. He got to the people. And he said to the servants, he said, my wedding feast is ready and nobody is seated. 
He said, go out to the highways and hedges and invite everyone you see, both bad and good. You say, what are you saying? Here's what I'm saying. I want you to go out to the highways and hedges and invite everybody you can because I want to see them live in freedom. What if they're bad people? Invite them. What if they're good people? Invite them. Because here's what I always say, and I preached a message on it a long time ago, even good people need to be born again. Because we need to be a church in the field. Again, so many people think, well, you know what? We have to be perfect before we can belong. But you know what? That's not the case here because we feel like that we let the Holy Spirit do the work of regeneration and sanctification. And so we are whosoever will. The church in the field means that you don't go through recycle souls. But you know what? We find people that are broken. We find people that are hurting. And we introduce them to a love that will heal them over time. You say, how can that be? Because guess what? Every one of us still have the Holy Spirit working on us. We'll stand this morning. And so today, we've heard some testimony about you living in freedom. We've heard people say they're living in freedom and maybe you're here and hopefully you are, but if you aren't, if you say, I'm not. Because here's what I know, if you're in bondage in any area of your life, you're not in freedom. And if you're here today and you say, you know what, I'm living in bondage in some area of my life. I want you to just slip your hand up in the air. Some of you won't because you're, you're shy about it. I'm just telling you, if you will, just raise your hand and say, you know what? I am. Here's what I want to do. I want to pray with you. If you're here today, I want you to come to the front. You say it. And, and again, I'm not going to call out your what you're in bondage for, and it doesn't mean it's sin. It doesn't have to be sin. It can be, there can be a lot of things. Fear can have you in bondage. Depression can have you in bondage. There can be many things that can have you in bondage. And I meant what I said when I come up here. If you're in bondage, I want you to leave this place free today. There's no reason. And so here's what I want to say to you. If you're living in any type of body, you say, I just, I need to be free. I need complete freedom. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pray, and I'm going to pray a dismissal prayer. If you're here with us today and you're a guest, we have a gift for you out at our guest service desk. You can also, as you leave, you can leave your connection card, please, on the chair. And I want you to walk in freedom. And so those of you that need to leave, hey, I understand. We want you to enjoy your holiday. Thank you for being here today. But those of you that say, hey, there's an area of my life that I would like to live in freedom. We're going to hang out. Prayer team, come on up. And we're going to hang out. We're going to pray with you. We're going to pray with you. Because I believe, I believe a lot of times we get in such a big hurry. We get in such a big hurry to get out. And we miss an opportunity. And so as I pray, you say, I need freedom. We're going to pray with you. Heavenly Father, we come to you today. Lord, I thank you for every individual in this house. Lord, I thank you for the freedom that we can experience, not only in the natural, but spiritually speaking. And Lord, today I believe that freedom is coming. I believe for every individual in this place, freedom is here. All they have to do is accept it. And so, Lord, as we are dismissing today, Lord, there's going to be ones that, Lord, we're going to pray over. And, Lord, I believe with all of my heart they're going to be set free and walk in freedom. And so, Lord, I thank you. I thank you, Lord, for this day. I thank you for these precious people. 
I thank you, Lord, for this word you give us. Lord, as always, we give you glory, honor, and praise in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. Again, if you need prayer today, please, please come to the front. If you need to leave, you are dismissed today.